I was going to say I was pretty good at the billing pad in terms of keeping track of my time. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, I had colleagues who'd be in there at the end of the month, like literally trying to capture all their time from the beginning of the month and slice Mm -hmm. it together. I mean, it's just like, you're treading, I felt like it's just always this battle of treading (laughs) water and you're never keeping your head above. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. I'm your host, Megan Henry, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nate Bolander. Hi, Nate. Good morning, Megan. How are you doing? Okay, I'm doing well. How about Good. yourself? Good. My eyes are, I'm looking at my eyes. I got The circles are getting darker and bigger uh, as the baby gets older. I was going to say, I think you're looking more rested. Mm, well, to be fair, it's a good thing you said that. My mom is here every Tuesday night, and we're doing this on a Wednesday. So last night was my one night a week where I get the, the full oh. shebang. So quite oh. nice. So how many hours did you get? Eight and a half. Oh, <gasps> that's more than I got. Uh, inter- interrupted with crying, <laughs> interrupted with feeding and things like that. But I mean, it's about, it's double, about double what is normal. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably only got like six. So you're you're looking good. Look at you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, so let me ask you as a, as a mother of two, it gets great at three months. It gets better for life, right? Like you just have to do this for three months and then you're good. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. I thought not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's see on a given night. Mm-hmm. I probably, I go to sleep in my bed. I usually have some child who joins me at some mm-hmm. point. Then I get uncomfortable. I usually then switch to some other bed mm-hmm. location and sleep there and then some other child probably finds me at some point mm. in my new location and so I would say my experience is normal but I wouldn't I wouldn't count on you having a full night's sleep for the rest of your life <laughs> okay all right well thanks a lot let's move unless on. you go so, on vacation <laughs> yeah well that's the thing right that's that's the only saving grace so. anyway I digress so mm. <laughs> today we have on Corey Herm and Corey is the director of claims of end broker which is a an insurance startup. Um, and so she's here to kind of talk about the challenges that are specific to startups and, you know, what she sees on, on her end. And, you know, I think it's super interesting coming from, you know, she worked for a long time at larger legacy carriers and now is at a much smaller, you know, startup carrier. So the challenges are, are very different. Uh, and I think her, her viewpoint is, you know, interesting to listen, listen to and, and to hear just how it's different on her end. Yeah. I love, I love people that get into the new kind of uh, forthcoming progressive way that people do business and how they got into it and how that's maybe better than the, than what's gone on in the past, how they're improving upon what's gone on in the past. Yeah. And some of the, just the unique challenges that, that she sees and that, you know, a a startup may see that's not, um, a a typical for a a much larger insurance company. So with that, let's bring her in. Good morning, Corey. Thank you for joining us this morning on the defense of arrest. How are you? Good. How are you, Megan? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Um, so, you know, I think you've listened to a few of these and I usually, um, what I do is I kind of, I like to get to know my guests and run through like how they got to where they are today. Cause I think that's, to me, that's an interesting story and I like to hear it. So everyone who has to listen, has to listen to me asking everyone where they got to where they are today. (laughs) But You know, you're currently the head of claims at Embroker, but you also, you know, you went to law school, you're a practicing attorney um, for some time. So I'm curious, how did you end up deciding that law school was the path that you wanted to take? Did you like, did you grow up in a family of lawyers or was it just like me that I was like, I don't know what else I'm going to do. So this is what I should do so I can get a job later. Exactly. I, <laughs> nothing interesting. Um, I know lawyers in my family and I was in college and had, I was a political science and English major with an art history minor. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life with this. And I like school and I was good at reading and writing. So just kind of fell into law school. So I was definitely one of the people in law school who was just kind of fell into it. Um, you know, a, kind of a large financial undertaking, right, to just kind of fall into, but not one of those people who had visions of saving the world as a public defender or came from a family of lawyers or anything like that. Um, And I think I kind of, I pretty much fell into the insurance industry the same way I think like most people do. Yeah, don't you wonder, like the, any of your classmates who were like the art history majors who didn't go to law school, like, do you wonder what, or or maybe you know, well, like, what are they, what are their jobs now? Like, I wonder this sometimes. I know. (laughs) You know, 
I don't think many of them have the jobs that we envisioned we would in college, right? Like these great jobs working in art galleries and things. I think that like everyone for the most part that I know of has jobs that have nothing to do with what we were learning in those classes whatsoever. If I, I could add a data point here, uh, my, girl, my, girlfriend, <laughs> my girlfriend's sophomore year of college was an art history major. And she is now, I believe, the uh, head of charitable giving for a big museum in New York. So I think that's that's See, the same. Those are the those yeah. are the jobs that you envision having. Yeah. So there you go. But nobody yeah. I knew end up in those positions. No, no, no. no. Like I, I feel like mo- anyone I know is like in marketing, <laughs> like marketing right? or teaching. Yeah, yeah. Well, so but you practice for for some time, um, and that and like what led you away from you know, actual practice? Yeah. So like you said, like I, like many people, I think in this industry kind of fell into insurance in general. Um, I stumbled upon an internship at what was the time was ACE USA when I was in law school. And so worked there part-time in their ENO claim group. So got some exposure to the industry there um, and was able to kind of just see what happened and work with all these lawyers. I'm like, this is great. These are all these lawyers. They're super fun. They're really casual. Everyone's wearing like corduroys and sneakers to the (laughs) office. And this isn't like law firms that I've interned at. Um, But I still had visions of becoming a matrimonial attorney and had done a little bit of work doing that and clerked for a family court judge uh, after law school. And I was like, this is not for me. So then I still wanted to be a practicing attorney, but turned towards the insurance route and did after my exposure at ACE um, and worked at a firm doing insurance coverage, bad faith litigation, representing a lot of Boyd's clients. Um, And, you know, like anyone else that I guess is working in the industry and private practice had exposure to all the clients and then saw the attorneys internally, um, got to know what they did, did some projects, ghostwriting projects and things like that for some of our internal clients. And that's kind of how I then fell into getting out of private practice and then moving into the industry and the in-house side. Um, of course, like the lore of not having the billing pad yeah. too, right, is always there. What's the allure of that? I don't understand. I love it. <laughs> you love that billing pad. Yeah, right? you have, yeah, you have, yeah it's beautiful. It's, 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 it keeps me going. Um, I, I was I pretty a, good at the billing. Yeah. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say I was pretty good at the the billing pad in terms of keeping track of my time mm-hmm. um, but I mean I had colleagues we'd be in there at the end of the month like literally trying yeah. to capture all their time from the beginning of the month and slice mm-hmm. it together I mean it's just like you're treading wa- I feel like it's just always this battle of treading <laughs> water and you're never keeping your head above yeah no I have a practice and Megan can tell you I'm, I'm really anal about it, about it having my billing up with my other stuff and I'm putting it in a second I do it because I'm going to forget you know if I go to me that's the only way that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I want to I want to go back because we have we share a path here. You you clerked in family court after law school. I did. Yeah. So where, where was it? OK, it was Jersey. Was it was it dependency court or was it custody and divorce court or, or were they merged in Jersey? So it was somewhat merged. Um, most So in family court is mostly it's divorce, matrimonial issues. And then it is also juvenile court and then Mm -hmm. DIFUS, which is child services um, in Mm -hmm. New Jersey. And they were all merged um, in family court. And I, my judge for the most part did DIFUS. So division of youth and family services. So it was like child removals. And then we did some matrimonial motions on Friday afternoons, Um, but it was all merged. And so we had one judge, not the one that I clerked for that was assigned to juvenile one that was assigned to DIFUS, which was my judge. And then they all handled smattering of matrimonial matters. And I know Megan, we're way off topic, but I I, uh, I clerked I clerked a dependency court. Uh, I clerked for a judge who just was elected, and so he didn't know where he was going to go. So he hired me as his first clerk, and I was going wherever he was going. And he went to dependency court, and that was incredibly eye opening, which I assume is like Dyfus in New Jersey. And when people say, you know, what was it like? I said, all I need to tell you is there were eight courtrooms in dependency court in Philly at the time, and we heard thirty to forty cases a day of dependence. I mean, yeah, that, that just that, tells, that just tells yeah, that just tells you the volume that you're dealing with. And what the problem is like in, in Philly. So I I digress. I've I've really ruined the mood now of the podcast. <laughs> Megan, Megan, bring it back. Let's let's well, get back I, well, I, bring it back I, to insurance. Yeah. Although no, I wanted to touch back on it though, because that is something I've hear, heard so much about from people that I, I feel like I know so many people who went in law school wanted to go the family law route and then 
you know, had some touch on it. Either they had internships with family law attorneys during, during law school or, you know, clerked or whatever outside of law school and none of them do it now. <laughs> I think, I think because of maybe that experience you had, I think it's just really emotionally hard to, it is to a see completely emotionally draining in different ways, right? Like yeah. I felt like the matrimonial work was emotionally draining, um, because your clients are very needy. It is probably like the worst time in their personal lives and nothing you can do will make them happy. Yeah. I think you just have to be a certain type of personality to do that. And then doing like um, mating on the dependency side is just emotionally draining from a completely different perspective. Um, I mean, I hate to say from no other way to put it. I mean, it's just depressing. It's really depressing and emotionally draining. Um, and I know in the court where I worked, they would rotate the judges out of that cycle every two years. I think it was for that reason specifically. Yep. Yeah. I remember yeah. the first case I ever had, 8 a.m., the first day, the first day I ever had a legal job, the first day of my clerkship, the first case that came before the court was a woman who had a mother who had burned her son's face, who was like one year old with, a, with an iron on purpose, oh, was God. crying, and she just, she put the iron on his face. That was the first day for number one case. And I said, this is going to be a tough, <laughs> a tough, tough clerkship. Year. And yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Oof. I mean, hence I'm, my then pivoting towards insurance. Yeah, let's get into that. Can we please get out of this? After my clerkship. <laughs> Thank you. Can we please get out of this, this chasm we're in? <laughs> so, yeah, you want to get over to where there's the the civil claims that, you know, someone negligently burns someone in the face. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. and, <laughs> anyway, but, well, once you let, like, once you moved uh, in, in-house to insurance and you let go of the billing, like, how was that adjustment period to you? Did you feel like you're like, wow, like, I could just like go in and do my work and, and leave. And I don't need to, you know, make sure I enter time for every single thing I do all day. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had a reflex of it when I first went, <laughs> I remember like my first three months or so when I was at the Hartford, I would constantly be going over like, oh, or I'm spending too much time on this one case. <laughs> so this one task, right. Which you can't do when you're in private practice, I need to move on to something else. But even though you have so many claims and cases on your desk when you're in-house, it, it's just, it's a different model, right? So I definitely have that reflex, I think, for the first 90 days of, I got to capture this time. I've got to make sure I've got this, or I've got to move on to something else. I'm spending too much time on this today. Um, so it's total readjustment of your mindset. Yeah. But I mean, I really liked it. I, I think I fell into it pretty easily in terms of just managing. It's a much higher volume. And you do have to readjust. You're not digging into the files so much, right? You're kind of sitting up here in this 90,000, not 90,000, but up higher from viewpoint. And you have to touch everything a little bit less, but everything needs to be touched. And one of my colleagues used to say it was like a, a hidden move where you have, say, 150 files on your desk. You have to be hitting everything and moving along and making decisions really quickly, which I really like because it moved, yeah. it moved pretty fast. Yeah. And, and but then you were also managing outside counsel in those roles too, correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like what the, basically the role that I used to, I was in previously. So h- how is that shift now too? And I, I've talked to a lot of people about this as well. Like suddenly you're on the inside looking out at, you know, some people that at a role that you were likely in and you have to have a different viewpoint as to um, what your counsel's doing and questioning something do. they might be doing. Yeah. And when I first went in-house, I, I I didn't spend that much time in private practice. So I was still on the fairly young side of being a practicing attorney. And so that's an interesting dynamic, right? Some of the partners yeah. that I used <laughs> to actually report to, then I was then now their client. Um, but it, it was still an interesting perspective because I knew what was on their desk, what was going on from the inside and what they were dealing with the state insureds or their clients. Um, so I do think that it helps from being on, on that side of it and seeing as opposed to not being on the practicing defense side and appreciating kind of what they're going through on their on that side of it a little bit. Um, but I do think it takes time and experience to, to kind of get that confidence to maybe challenge some of those attorneys on what they're doing strategically or billing wise. Like those are tough conversations to have, right? And when you do come out of the law firm, if you're maybe not say partner level or at a higher level, I was definitely a junior associate when I left. It, it's an interesting dynamic to then turn around and say to some partners at law firms, or especially ones that you used to report to, why did you bill so much for this motion? <laughs> or, you know, I don't think we should be taking this in that direction. That comes with time, I think. 
And did you find that even though, like you were like a junior, as you said, junior associate when you left, like, did you find like once you went like inside insurance company, did you find like there was a lot of more interest in you and your role from people that either at your old firm or other people you had like associate with something like people want to get work from you. Is it suddenly, did you have a lot new friends? Like, you know, yes. you know, it's interesting since I've started here at Embroker, I have a lot new friends, yeah. um, mm-hmm. right? Because look, law firms are a business um, and I can appreciate that. And, you know, there's a limited amount of work and now, now, right now in the industry, not just in the insurance tech space, but in, in the whole space, there's so many new companies, but it's like, you know, our company, I was like fresh blood in the water almost. Um, and lawyers are business people. We're not taught this in law school, but a lot of lawyers are business people. And that's what you're charged with is bringing in business and making money. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I did see that and I'm seeing it now kind of all over again. Um, yeah you know, people with the interest in the business. And, and I, I can appreciate why, again, because law firms are a business and, and you have to find it somehow. And that's something that I, I wasn't at least taught in law school is part of the job. I was just, I always say it at conferences, when you go to conferences, you know who the claims folks are and who the attorneys are because you see <laughs> one person surrounded by a circle of other people. I said, you could definitely tell who's who. You know, everyone's like yeah. sharks in the water trying to- it's Literally like sharks yeah. in the water, yeah. Um, I, my question was, when you when you say that you're an attorney, when you tell that you're, you're uh, assigned counsel that you're an attorney, do you see them change the way they're reporting or change the way that they talk to you? Because when, you, when people say claims folks, then people say, I'm a former attorney who has moved to the insurance industry. Do you find that people's mindset changes and they, they kind of know that they're talking to someone a little more seasoned in that role and they've been on the other side? Not always, but I have sometimes. I, I'm thinking of a specific instance. I went to a mediation for a claim that I was overseeing when I was at the Travelers. And um, I was the manager on the file and I, I went to the mediation. So I wasn't involved in the day to day. I just kind of helicoptered in for that. And I met with the attorneys uh, for breakfast before the mediation. And it was a California claim. And one of the attorneys was in California. And one that represented the client was from New York. And I was talking about some of the elements for the to meet for disability discrimination claims and uh, taking reasonable steps to accommodate. And one of them looked at me and she said, are you a lawyer? <laughs> and and it, it completely changed the conversation mm-hmm. and the dynamic I had with them after that. And that's not always the case. And I've worked with a lot of claims folks that are not, not attorneys, but have been doing it for 20, yeah. 30, 40 years, mm-hmm. right? And, and are just as tuned into everything as attorneys. But there are yeah, definitely certain circumstances where I've seen that happen. What I also feel like from, like from our standpoint, like it, you have to have respect for the the claims folk even if they they ha- they're not attorneys they probably know more than you like they, right we, yeah. <laughs> you know they've seen more things and more scenarios come across their desks I, I'm willing to bet more than like Nate and I have seen just from the sheer right. volume and experience and oftentimes the non attorneys have worked in so many different lines of business so they yeah. bring all that perspective in right they might be working in commercial specialty lines now but they've done GL or property or something like that in the past. So they're really bringing all these different perspectives and hats in from the insurance perspective, right? That none of us might have. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like it, it's, it would only, it's hurtful to counsel who like, don't understand that or don't appreciate that. Like I, I would imagine if I were in like your shoes and I had a counsel, like trying to give me like, I know better attitude because I'm an attorney. I, it would just completely turn me off be like, mm. yeah. <laughs> exactly. sure and you know and then the, again and that's the other thing too like a lot of these claims folks attorneys or not have been embedded in the industry for so long and we're handling such a volume of cases that we have our own relationships right with plaintiff's counsel mm-hmm. i mean i need i'm thinking of one specific in the philly area and every time i i kept coming across him for a while every time i see him the mediation he'd sigh at me <laughs> Oh, Miss Herm, here you are again. Um, and you oh, know, come and on, give us a leaders. name. Give us a name. Let's. Oh, no, you're not. I'm kidding. Steve? I'm kidding. You're not kidding. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you can't, hey, listen, if you're going to, I was just that out. Um, <laughs> they have relationships with the mediators, right? Because the, these claims folks are handling hundreds and thousands of cases, oftentimes within the jurisdiction with which they sit. Mm-hmm. So they're seeing these mediators, judges, opposing counsel on a regular basis and have their own relationships with them. So Megan, to your point, it's 
it's, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice as outside counsel of not really partnering with your claims folks because they have their own viewpoint and relationships with, with the parties involved that you can really leverage to kind of drive things in a favorable direction. It's so, it's so much easier to work with a claims individual who's, who's done work in that venue before. I mean, I've had, yeah. I've had claims that have been wonderfully, this wonderful partnership between me and the claims adjuster because for the claims individual, because they they say, listen, here's my roadmap for the case. I'm thinking liabilities adverse. I have, I have a mediator. I love see if they're on board for mediation, get a dem- I mean, it's like you're, they're in tune with you and they're you're like, yes, I, I've had conversations with claims people that at the end I'm like, sure, that's it. You're right. right. You're hundred percent right. <laughs> I, I thought, that's what I was going to say to you. And you did, you took the words out of my mouth and it makes it so much easier than uh, dragging the case through the mud and, and like explaining everything every step of the way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like utilize their expertise. And like you just said, Nate, they're so attuned to a lot of times the jurisdictions with which they're mm-hmm. in, if they're handling cases there specifically and, you know, and the mediators and the judges and the juries and how, and you know, that's just a resource that it, it's a shame not to, to try and utilize, right. To drive right. your claim. Right. Yeah. It certainly helps to move, move things along to, I mean, what do we all want typically is to close, close files. So mm-hmm. I mean, certainly working right. together is going to assist that process. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I want to pivot over to Embroker and, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about how it came that this opportunity, I mean, came to you and how, how, you know, how you were to embrace, you know, basically starting working at a startup and, you know, how, how that came to over to your desk, I should say. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say I've always worked um, at legacy carriers, right? Large legacy carriers over the course of my career. I worked at um, a third-party claim administrator for a while too, but that was a a large organization um, and really was in like some great positions at legacy carriers, but that was always my background really and my upbringing. So this is a total 180 pivot. Um, And I think I was just looking for something new and exciting, right? We're all kind of been home for these past two years in the pandemic. And I used to travel a lot and the the workday and the literal desk, maybe it'd become a little rote. And this is literally something that just kind of like fell into my, into my vision um, and the opportunity came up at the end of last year. And it is, again, like I said, a complete 180. So Embroker is obviously new to the space. We're an insurance tech startup um, based out of the Bay Area and was started in 2015 and um, provide professional lines to small companies, venture capital backed startups. So really, you know, very, very small companies, um, as opposed to my position prior to this, I was working with financial institutions, large banks, other insurance companies, and publicly traded companies. So uh, not just the company and the position that I'm in, but the companies I'm working with on the claim side are also completely different as well. Um, And we're providing them with employment practices, liability, director, officer insurance, crime, cyber. So the whole suite of specialized lines and, and the concept is that they can go online, go into our portal and obtain their insurance um, on their own. And that is this e- radically simple ease of process. Um, and that if you meet the qualifications and it takes out kind of the step of and our broker partners aren't going to like to hear this, but using the outside broker to procure your professional liability insurance and, and kind of having this ease of process for it. So um, it, basically coming on something that was on the ground up and that has this digital platform, which in the commercial specialty line space, I think is something that's really new, right? We see it on the personal line space. I know right. for myself, at least like yeah. I had an auto claim last year. I didn't speak to anyone. <laughs> I did it all entirely online. It was fantastic. And I do the same when I get my personal lines insurance, but it's really something new in the commercial line space um, where typically there is a lot of touching and handholding and, and interaction um, and, and trying to work through kind of those algorithms and things and needs to meet the qualifications that these insurers are going to need and then be able to obtain their, their policy. So I think it's super exciting. It was a really exciting opportunity to get a, not just a company from the ground up, but really in the claim side from the ground up um, and build that infrastructure from nothing. Whereas I've been at legacy carriers right, where everything has been in place um, for hundreds of years in some cases. And that, that's what I was going to ask. Do you find when you join a startup, you have more of a say in the policies and procedures that you're going to follow and the way that you go about business? Because 
if you join something where things are so entrenched and like legacy uh, carriers are, you know, you probably have to fit into their mold, right? Just fit, fit your square peg into that square hole. Exactly. Whereas if you join someone new, you probably, they probably look to you and say, well, listen, you're one of the first people here. What do you think we should do? How do you think we should handle this? That's exactly it. And that's part of the reason I came, but it's definitely a shift, right? It's like coming from the law firm to in-house um, <laughs> where it's like, I think we should do this. And in this, right in the startup field, it's like, we'll do it. We don't have anything. Like, <laughs> right, you know, right. okay, so go forth and do it. And let's right. do it next week. Right. Or is it a larger right. company, whether it's insurance or not, if you want to implement a change, it's, you know, longer term vision for, for smaller changes here. Right. It's right. We have nothing. So we have to put into place something. So it's, it's not so much of that, like mother may I mentality that you have to mm-hmm. get out of right from being at a larger carrier. It's just like, great, go do it. You know, make right. sure you get that done by the end of next week. Um, right. So you have something. Yeah. Which is exciting. Um, sometimes though, I sit back and like, oh, I hope this works. Um, but the thing, I think the part of it is, is that a lot of things aren't going to work that we do. Um, and that's maybe I'd say part of the fun, but part of the challenge of it is that we are going to fail at certain things or I'm going to fail at certain things. And then it's learning from those mistakes and pivoting off of those in a relatively quick fashion as well to, to put something better in place. Yeah, because you must be encountered with so many things that weren't even part of your your sphere before, you know, like, like you know, when you're yeah. working for a legacy carrier and, you know, a lot of th- things are already set and they're in, in line and you just kind sure. of follow, hop on the train and, you know, go to the destination and now you're, you're creating the course. And yeah, I mean, there must be some things that you're like, I didn't even know this was a thing. And now I need to make a decision about it. Yeah, like, I mean, there's literally no infrastructure, right? And the company has been around since 2015, and I believe selling policies since 2016, right? But we all know that the claims come in a lag. um, And the claim, the world of our claims is still relatively small, but right, there's no infrastructure. So when I came in November, there's so many things I'd be working on. Oh, wait, I don't have a panel. Oh, wait, not only do I not have a panel, well, I'll start to put that together, but I have no defense guidelines. <laughs> so it's like every time you take one step forward, you see something else and you have to take two steps back because, right, you don't have any of that infrastructure that you have to put yeah. in place. Um, and I think being at the legacy carriers where everything is not only in place, but it, they're well oiled machines, I'm so used to this level of perfection that has to be let go of because I don't have any infrastructures. So I have to put something in place and it's not going to be perfect and I have to be okay yeah. with it. It just has to be functional. As long as it's functional right now, like we can work to get to perfect one day. Um, yeah. But right now functional is kind of the baseline of what we're looking for. And it's also from a cost standpoint, there's, I'm sure there are challenges. It's not like you don't have an open checkbook just to spend on, on any, not that you do it at yeah. Legacy Carry either, but it's certainly like the, there is probably more of an eye to the bottom line and what you're spending on certain things. And you can't just hire, you know, just to hire, right. like you need to be mindful of how you're spending money. Right. And I would say the resources are different, yeah. right? Um, like here, there's been a couple circumstances where I've had needs for certain things, or I have myself and someone said to me, well, why don't you hire a consultant to take care of this for a couple months on a part-time basis? So those are like resources that are right. Maybe more, um, you can be more economically flexible and have those type of resources where I think that you didn't have those availability of resources at a larger legacy care where everything is so structured and you might have just more overall resources, but here you can be more creative about it because you do be, have to be more conscious of budget and things like that, but you still have to get things done. So you can be a little bit more creative and say, okay, yeah, maybe I'll hire a consultant on a part-time basis to work on this project with me. I don't need to hire, do an ad to staff for it. Um, or maybe I can procure this software that's already been put together as opposed to you know, us internally hiring a team to build something out. And that might be more economically beneficial. So it, it forces us like this level of creativity and sourcing mm-hmm. and things. Um, because right, like you're saying, you don't have all these unlimited resources for everything. Are you, are you working on different types of lines? Because you mentioned kind of more unique and niche lines you're working on now versus when you were at the legacy carrier. Was it more broad? And do you enjoy it more now? I think it's a, it is a little bit more broad. Um, I have always 
in my career been an EPL and DNO specialist. Okay. Um, and I did do some when I was at the TPA, some ENO, LPL work. And here we're really offering most of those lines of business. We have an LPL program as well, and then are offering the DNO, um, EPL, crime, cyber, fiduciary. I really personally have not had a lot of experience in cyber. So it's been stretching my legs that way. And I do think it's fun. Um, I always have said, you know, when I went to the TPA, I kind of went, I don't say kicking and screaming, but handled ENO and LPL claims with kicking and screaming because my specialty was always DNO and EPL. But I do think it's good for folks to have experience in so many lines of business, right? It's great to be an expert in one, but to have and maybe have dabbled at some point in all these different lines of business mm-hmm. on any side, but special, I'm thinking specialty commercial lines, because that's what I'm in. Um, and to really have that experience, because then you could pivot easily or be in this position. You know, I'm really trying to literally went to CLM two weeks after I started <laughs> to educate myself on <laughs> cyber claims yeah. <laughs> um, and the current state of the cyber world. And it's going to be a resources we can do that. But um, I think if you have some of that exposure, you can pivot very easily. But I do, I mean, it is fun. I do like kind of having a hand in all these different lines of business right now. Yeah. And so what in the lines um, that you're handling, like what, what have you seen the most shift and change in since like the, the start of your career, you know, when you started in DNO and it, like, what, what have, how have you seen the, it shift and the types of claims you see? I would say, I mean, I don't know about in the types of claims that we see. I would say that right now, at least, I feel like we're tending to see things that are, we see claims from us and they're not li- li- necessarily in litigation right away. And Right now, I'd say in the past six months, I feel like I'm tending to see claims and folks more willing on both sides, plaintiff and opposing counsel and our insureds willing to settle pre-litigation or come to some sort of resolution and things starting more as a pre-litigation type of claim than complaints just landing on our desk out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, I'm, I feel like, you know, I intake all of our new claims and I'd say the majority of them or pre-litigation circumstances, whether they're demand letters or on the EEOC side, administrative charges, um, or just notices of circumstances or draft complaints. I'm seeing more of that than just things just charging right into litigation and folks trying to work through um, resolutions prior to litigation being filed. And I don't know if that's a result of like the past two years and the COVID environment or people not being as litigious. I don't think it's a bad thing though, because since my career started, I also think a major shift has been defense fees as a result of aggressive plaintiffs' counsels have just become astronomical, mm-hmm. yeah. um, I would say. And I have worked both now and in my previous positions, not just with panel counsel type of partners that we have relationships with, but all different types of law firms when insurers have choice of counsel. And it's across the board. It's just... Um, and plaintiff's counsel has become extremely aggressive over the course of the past, maybe say five, six years, and has really driven the cost of defending claims up. So the shift towards maybe potentially earlier resolutions is potentially favorable, I think, yeah. because defense costs have just become astronomical. Right. So what sort of tactics are you seeing, you know, from counsel that like are, are there those, what are those aggressive tactics that you've been seeing? I mean, it definitely like scorched earth litigation tactics yeah. um, in some circumstances, right? In California, they love that. Um, and I think they love to kind of press upon this current state of social inflation. And a lot of these topics and things are kind of out there in the media and social media, and it's having an influence on society in the United States at large. And then therefore, potential jurors opinions, especially in certain parts of the country. And they are plaintiff's counsel talking about is leveraging that absolutely leveraging that to kind of scare opposing counsel and the insurance industry, I think, I mean, I really think that they're, they have been leveraging that to share to scare the insurance industry into settling claims. And then that's really just pushing the value of them up, right? Because folks are saying, I can't let this get to a jury trial in downtown LA. So I'm going to pay a premium to settle this. 
but that's just increasing the value of everything unnecessarily. And I do think there has to be a, a reset on that um, in, in some regard, because it's just going to become unsustainable at some point. Yeah. You, so do you see a difference between urban versus rural environments? I mean, you just mentioned that South, central LA. Do you see that plaintiff's councils are willing to push more mm-hmm. in areas where they know they can get a nuclear verdict? than in areas where it's a little more favorable for the defense, the jury breakdown would be more favorable for the defense. I think so. Yeah. I think as a general, in a general sense, yes, I have seen plaintiff's counsel and maybe more rural areas push, but it's because they might have a fact pattern that they think has this inflammatory set of facts that's Mm -hmm. going to really inflame the jury pool that they might have on that case. But I do think Think that I do think is in a general sense, yes, much more specific to urban areas, um, and that they're really plaintiffs' counsels ch- are cherry picking certain cases with fact patterns that they know will be really um, inflammatory to a jury, a- and then just you know, for lack of a better way to put it, kind of exploiting the, that. Yeah, right. I I do think to touch back on the, how you're seeing the resolution on pre, like or more things come across your desk pre suit. Um, and a willingness to resolve them early. I, I, it is my like my humble opinion that COVID does have a lot to do with that because there's such a backup in in the courts and tri- like yeah. they're not no one's seeing trials like they there's not you can't hold that over anyone's head anymore that the trial costs are going to be so significant because trials are so far down even further down the road than they ever were before <laughs> and I right. know the courts are trying but there, it's just like there was a two year backup like there's only so much that they really can can do um so i i do think that's probably why we're seeing you know a willingness to you know kind kind of get things done pre-suit because avoid the costs avoid the costs of filing a complaint and you know the filing fees alone and then they're like if we can just sit down and talk maybe about this without going through that effort with or without defense counsel. I mean, just talk, talk to Corey or with some of your people and then, you know, maybe you can get it done without having all these extra fees. Yeah, I agree. And right. And we're on the civil litigation side, right? So these courts are going to clear out their criminal backlogs yeah. first. Those are going to take priority. And I, I am getting the sense that the plaintiff's counsel bar is, is seeing that as well and maybe communicating to their clients, right? Because the average plaintiff in reality, they're going to have to wait years and years for a trial and a judgment that might or might not go in their favor. And then if it does, you know, appeals after that. So, you know, does the average plaintiff really want to wait and go through that when they could potentially resolve a case in the next you know, 90 days? Right. And move on and with I their think, lives. I, you know, and I, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> and, and I think courts are more, courts are more, uh, vociferous about, you know, when you get to the pretrial phase, did you try to resolve this? And I think of what, especially in federal court, I do some federal yes. court work because I do aviation law. So I remove a lot to federal court and judges are always, you know, when you go to, when you start your pretrial, they, they basically say without saying, if you waste my time on a case that you could have settled six months ago, and if you can go back and say, your honor, I, I hate to, I hate to tattle on my opposing counsel, but here's some emails where I wanted to mediate this three months ago and they didn't even respond to me. The judge will, I, I've had judges say, go mediate it and come back to me. I mean, almost, they're going to throw you in, over to the magistrate, right? Like, goodbye. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and I think, I think even in state court, they would have done that five or 10 years ago. I think now there's built in mechanisms to, for alternate, al- alternate dispute resolution that wasn't there a decade ago. So I think there's a, they know if they don't participate on the front end, the, the judge is going to have a problem on the back end. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And I think another thing that's indic- in, indicative of this is that a lot of the mediators right now are backed up. They're booked oh for mm-hmm. months. Yes. They're booked into the summer. Yep. I know. No, I just tried to schedule a mediation. I thought we were going to get it scheduled like the end of March. And now it's the end of June. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which is to me, another sign, right. That, that everyone's looking to try and resolve matters. Yeah. So what are some challenges that you've seen, you know, with counsel, you know, being, being a startup and having, again, you have cost restraints and, and you also have specialty lines. So I'm sure you're seeing some, you know, pain points and issues with outside counsel and costs and how it affects your bottom line. 
Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, there's different types of policies out there, right? There's policies in specialty lines that are duty to defend that turn the defense when the policy is triggered over to the carrier. And then in those circumstances, we would appoint counsel off of, you know, say a panel that we have with pre-negotiated rates and counsel that we're familiar with. And then there's policies that give insured choice of counsel um, and they can choose counsel um, and the rates are kind of what they are. Um, and I think that that drives a huge difference in terms of if you're just looking at bottom line numbers, um, absolutely. Because if you're looking at a firm that's charging say $1,200 an hour to defend a DNO claim, um, on a, cho- a policy where the insured has choice of counsel versus one where it's duty to defend. And of course, you know, you always hear the arguments from the insureds. Well, this is your cut rate attorney. Well, it's not because if you walked in off the street, you would not be paying this rate, right? It's the benefit of having the insurance and our relationship with these lawyers that you're getting this rate. Um, but just those numbers alone, it's, really eye-opening to com- to do that comparison. I have seen it and, and see the difference. Um, I, I, you know, and I do, from my perspective, think it's somewhat of a challenge to, to not always, not definitely not always, but it is more of a hurdle sometimes to partner with firms that are not, don't have relationships with law for, with insurance companies or don't have a familiarity with working with insurance companies, which I always find interesting because for civil litigation, most civil litigation is insured in some way, right. is insured in some way, shape or form. It goes back to what we were all talking about earlier. It, it you know, it's, it behooves you to, to partner with your insurance carrier partners yeah. and not make an enemy out of them or not look at yourselves as adverse parties, which I don't think happens as much as it used to, but it still happens. And it just is strange to me. Um, And I don't understand why sometimes law firms don't want to partner with the insurance carrier partners um, to to try and resolve claims for their clients. But I I think that the the matter is, again, just the bottom line of you're looking at different centers of rates. um, And I think that matters are just looked at differently as well. I was talking to an insured recently And she was saying, a general counsel, I'd insured, um, I'm saying, you know, I think that this law firm is, they have their litigation hat on and they're doing a great job, but they just have blinders on or litigating. And now the fact that we're litigating this matter and it's out there, it's affecting my company in different ways, our ability to fundraise um, because we have this litigation out there. And so we have a business need to not have this litigation going on anymore, but the law firm's not thinking like that. They're just thinking what their litigation had on. Um, And so that's a challenge that I I see frequently. And and I'm so going from, you know, being at a legacy carrier and over to like an, like insure tech, do you, have you seen a difference in kind of like the, and you alluded to this earlier too, that's where I'm going with this, like the, the type of insurance you have in, you know, in your portfolio, like you there, I imagine, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, they're probably, they're smaller and they, they, them too might not have a lot of the checks and balances in base in place as some of, you know, the insurance you may have seen at your legacy carriers. Is, are you finding, seeing that as to be accurate? Absolutely. Especially because in my position at my prior um, position, before I came to M Broker, I was managing claims for publicly traded companies and financial institutions. Totally. Right. So (laughs) yeah, I mean, large publicly traded companies with risk management, human resources, general counsel's offices, this is totally different. You're right. And and not that my prior employers didn't have those small books of business, but I just necessarily wasn't always working on them. But yeah, absolutely. Mike. And these, the insurers that we're working with are very small companies. Um, Oftentimes they're startup companies themselves and are really just trying to find their, their legs. And I think it's, it's sometimes fun to work with these insurers too, because they're really smart folks. And oftentimes we are working with founders or CEOs, people that really got these companies off the ground. And they're aware that there are these risks or needs, but 
or need, just need some education around them and they're looking for it. I had a call with an insured last week to literally go line by line through their cyber and tech policy with them and talk about what it meant and what it covered. And they initiated that because they really wanted an education on that. Yeah. So there's more of an ability to kind of get out in front um, and work with these insureds to help educate them. And they want to know what their risks are and then what are their coverage needs and what, you know, counsel or, or vendor needs do they have? Um, and I do, I'm a, I appreciate that there, there is this kind of um, awareness that they have in getting in front of things and they're doing it necessarily not after they get a claim, but before, especially in the oh, cyber yeah. front, I'm seeing that, that there's a very much an awareness of that. And, and you have to appreciate that from, you know, as an insurer, be like, oh, I'm so glad they're getting in front of this and not, you know, we're not after the fact and like, shit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, we had this call last week with an insured to, like I said, to go over their cyber policy. And, you know, they thank you for your time. It's like, I, I, this is great. Like that you really want to get in front of and try and prevent claims. Yes. And then in the event that you have them understand what your coverage will be. And what the needs will be in terms of, I mean, they were doing so much due diligence that they wanted to know what our panel breach council were so they could interview them and have somebody in place in the event of a breach. I mean, so they were really getting in front of it. So yeah, I definitely said so there's like a real appreciation for that. And one of the funniest things I always hear when, we, when you finish a big case, and it usually when, when you settle a case, no one's really happy. That's like, isn't that what people say? It's a sign of a good settlement where no one's happy. So yeah. you go to, you go to the insured. And the insured may be a product manufacturer. It's their baby, right? They've, they've developed it over the course of 50 years and they have all these safety features and everything else. And you say, you know, they say, listen, we're so sick of dealing with these claims. They're all the same. There's always the same problem with our product. And of course, the, the very um, common sense response from me is, why don't we look into why, right? Can we, can right. we look at your warnings? Can we look at your manuals? Can we look at your production line? Can we look? And they say, well, listen, we just pay this huge thing out. You know, we, we just, you know, our insurance company did, but we just got hit with this. We've spent enough money for now because that's going to cost money to do that. So they go down the road and then six months later, I get a call, same kind of claim, same venue. And by the way, the plaintiff's attorneys are talking, right? They're on these, they're right. on these group chats and they're saying, well, listen, I just hit this client, this, this company for this much. Why don't you try it? I have the same kind of fact pattern. And they've already made the roadmap for it. So it's just frustrating to, to see the same thing over and over again. It gives us work, right? So, I mean, it's like... Fair enough. But, uh, but I, I don't know why people don't have the foresight like you're talking about to say, listen, we've had five of the same claims. Maybe we should go and spend a little money on the front end to, to fix this. Right. right. And not be so reactionary. Right. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. historically what our clients all tend to do. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. A lot of the, the, the insurance that we're seeing in the startup space, you know, really intelligent folks and obviously don't work in this world, but they have an awareness that these risks are there and really want to have an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And that's something new that I've never seen before. And I think it's great. And also, you know, from being at, you know, a startup and working with other startups, I feel like there must be like a common, like, Hey, we're all in this together. Look at what you're doing. Yes. Look at what yeah. we're doing. Like, and you can kind of commiserate too about the challenges that, you know, the challenges that they might be seeing might be similar to the challenges that you've experienced too. So you could kind of like, it's like having company, uh, like having company in this world that's, you know, new for, for, and maybe it's not new for some of them. Maybe it's like their fifth startup and this is like an old hat. Yeah. I don't know. I would imagine. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's part of the reason that a lot of them feel a comfort level, maybe working with us, but then at the same time, there's folks that they can use as resources internally, right. That have been embedded in the insurance industry that they can use as expert resources to guide them on obtaining their policies and their claim handling and, and everything. But right, they're kind of, we're all in this kind of startup world together. Yeah. And so do you, and does this platform that Embroker uses, do you, I mean, I, I think my answer is yes to my question, but you know, I, I mean, making it so user-friendly for, for an entity to, you know, obtain their, you know, their EPL coverage and their DNO coverage or their cyber coverage. Like, I feel like this is like how things are shifting away to, to make these processes a little easier and less daunting than having to go sit with the broker and having them, you know, write it, like figure out the whole policy. It might not be for everybody, but it seems like this is how right. the market is shifting. 
I think so. Yeah. And I think that's why our CEO, Matt Miller, started in broker was because he saw that that's the way things are shifting. And we, we live in such a digital world. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially for small companies of this nature, is it necessary to sit through that process of with a broker? And that takes weeks, sometimes months to obtain yeah. your insurance, right? Mm-hmm. We're not talking about the targets of the world where you know, they're, they're large and there's so much risk and so much involved in procuring coverage. And we're talking about the small companies and it shouldn't have to be so difficult, especially in this digital world. And that's exactly why they, you know, Matt started this company. And I really think that things are moving that way. Do you you find that your insurance have picked you because of that? They're they're sick of doing it. I think so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Right. And everybody, and, and, everybody's living in a digital world, I think right now, regardless of what your nature of your business is and the ease of being able to procure the insurance, right? When your business, I think for most people, like, well, it's just something that uh, to do, right? You, I have to get insurance. They don't want to be spending hours and days and weeks getting it. It's the ease of process. So yeah, I think yeah. that is absolutely things that are making the, att- the platform attractive to them. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you, you've seen in the last like however so many years, like this rise of like, like look at like pie for like comp insurance. And then you've seen these rise of like all these insure tech companies, like filling the, filling the space to, to make a, you know, a, a consumer model that works. Yeah. I mean, I know I was speaking to somebody recently who said that they were looking for an apartment in, in Brooklyn and, um, and they did the application and they had to get runner's insurance before before they applied and they didn't realize that. And they're like, it literally went outside on the street on my phone. I went to lemonade and, and got a policy in, in five minutes. Yep. Yep. Well, the coolest things I've ever heard is I do, I do some aviation work. So there's drone uh, okay. recreational drone users and you can turn insurance on and off every half hour, which is the coolest thing. I mean, there's a, there's a company out there that you go out with your drone, you get all set up, you get your phone, you say, okay, start insurance. You fly around and yeah. insurance and you, you pay 17 bucks or so. It's like, you know, renting one, of those, yeah, renting one of those scooters in downtown, you know, Nashville, oh. right? It's like, you well, just turn it on and off. Right. Nate speaks from experience. About you know, what's funny. Scooters. I was going to say renting scooters in downtown cities. And I thought of Corey, I, after a long night in Nashville, I rented a scooter by myself to get, the, I was going out to try to find dessert at three in the morning because I was <clears throat> ready for dessert. And, <laughs> and I, I rented a scooter. I went down the street, turned left, went, I, I, I hit the curb, went over the handlebars, ripped my suit, brought this, brought the scooter back in front of the hotel, parked it. And I woke up the next morning, not so with it. And I checked my phone. I had rented a scooter for 90 seconds. <laughs> so... This has become. So you are not the first person that told me a story like that. <laughs> really good, thank. You. I was hoping I wasn't the only degenerate that was that had done this, but I you don't think ill of me. It was a long, <laughs> a long, a long evening, but I. So. Well, in that vein, too, we where I live in an urban area, we had a pilot scooter program for a summer, mm-hmm. and they never came back after that. They never came back after the pilot. Yeah. They were wildly popular with everyone yeah. here. Um, but again, urban area and Mm -hmm. they did not come back after the pilot, I think for similar types of reasons. Well, in Nashville combination of what's, I forget what the name main street is there with all the bars combination of that plus kind of hip Broadway plus kind of hilly, more hilly than you'd think. I mean, not a good, not a good combo, especially for me. So yeah. And in an (laughs) urban area, I mean, I won't even ride a bike. I don't even trust myself to ride the bike around. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So so, okay, well, Megan, take it away. I'll well, switch. no, I have I, I have to talk about the scooters quickly too because I a few years ago we were in DC and they're everywhere in DC and while they're convenient, I, they add such a mess because people just mm-hmm. drop them wherever they yep. want. Like they don't yep. park them back where they might belong. They just like I'm done with my scooter and they just like leave it on the on the sidewalk or leave it on the front steps of a museum or whatever it may be. And I'm like, this is. I, I could see why like your, your city after the pilot program was like, maybe we don't want these scooters around. And like all these people flying around on scooters, no idea what they're doing. And they crash it into everything. Yeah. yeah. And it's different. Like we have city bikes and that works out fine. Like yeah. every yeah. city bikes, you know, people run them there. They they're in the, um, the drop-off stations and people riding around like regular bikes. I don't know what the difference is, but scooters become <laughs> this like wild hazard. Um, but they should, when they run out those scooters, but, like you also get, insurance for mm-hmm. the 90 seconds that you're running a scooter 
Yeah. I needed it. I needed it because it cost more than that to tailor my suit, you know, so maybe I could have made a claim. Well, what did it have covered fixing your suit is the question. I, I probably had to pay a premium for that, but, you know, I upgraded my insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, after that, the state that you may have been in at that time at three o'clock yeah. in the morning. Not something I make a habit of. You know, I had never been to Nashville before. I didn't know I was going to. You, you learned. It's fun. I did. I did quickly. <laughs> and yeah. and the next thing you were going to do was ride one of those bikes that you just drink and ride the bike with all your friends. And you oh, the pe- pe- pedal tour or whatever? Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> Nothing bad can come of that. No, never. Um, well, so, Corey, if, you know, if you could go back and give your, like, your younger self any advice to do anything differently at, compared to where you are, are now, could you think of what, what advice you'd give yourself? Part of it would be what I was mentioning before is to force myself to kind of branch out and like dabble in more different lines of business to get experience in them and really push that. And I really, I almost feel like companies should do that too, because um, I think that folks get so entrenched in becoming say DNO experts or EPL experts or cyber experts. And that's great because you have people are so embedded in those lines and really have historical knowledge but then that really, from a career perspective, kind of pigeonholes you, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it makes it difficult. And sometimes you get bored or you just want to learn something new. So I think that it helps to push yourself. And I would have told myself to do that um, and and try to branch out a little bit more that way. And I think that that just from a career perspective then opens up a lot more possibilities to you. And then even makes it easier if you end up in a position like I am now where you're handling all the lines of business, even if you just had some experience in all of them to kind of get your legs under you and get off and running. Yeah. And do you still like for when you were in private practice, do you still like hear from or keep in touch with any of like the partners or attorneys that you worked for? Like, are they still your friend? Are they still knocking down? On your door? They're, they're de- no, but they're like my legitimate friends. That's um, good. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I took some time off in between my prior position and starting here and met with the, the partner that I work for, for coffee. Um, and they are just such a good group of people. And I actually recently was saying we were, I was talking with my coworkers about where, um, we learn different things. And one of the partners that I worked for in my old firm, I said, I, he literally taught me how to mediate a case. I literally like went with him and he was an expert and he, I watched him and he taught me how to mediate a case. Um, and then I, a couple of weeks after that, I reached out to him with my new information. And he said to me, Corey, I remember when I taught you how to mediate a case. <laughs> um, so they're all still my friends. They actually invited me to a retirement party for somebody in the industry that they're hosting next week. So yes, the, the long answer is yes. And they're actually my my real friends, not just my good. business friends as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I think a, a benefit of this industry that a lot of people don't realize is, and I have, you know, friends that we go to each other's weddings and, and do vacations together that I've met through the industry, either we're colleagues or just met through other people is that it is, it's a large tight knit industry. And there are some really great people in it in terms of being business partners, but also on a personal level as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I do find that's like when, um, like I, I didn't cap, I didn't grasp that concept early on. I think, well, no one explained to me like how to market. I think coming, you know, yeah. early in my career, they're like, just said, just go market. And I was like, well, what does that mean? What's that mean? <laughs> you know, and it took a while to figure it out, but it was really just like, find people you like and just talk to the people you right. like and develop relationships with them. And that's like, that's the most genuine marketing time you can, you can spend because it doesn't feel like you're do- it's forced. Feel like something on their back and it's not forced. You're like just yeah. cultivating relationships with people that you enjoy being around. Right. And then it's, you know, I can't wait to see Megan and have lunch with her when she's in town, as opposed to, Oh, this lawyer wants to take me out to lunch. <laughs> um, yeah. That's another one of those things they don't teach you in law school. No. Right. And I, I don't know if it's changed, but I feel like it should. Like, I, I, I feel like in law school, they need to teach you, you know, okay, you're going to go if you go, if you t- opt to take this route that you're going to go work for a law firm, there's some things you need to know. Like, okay, most law firms are paid by insurance companies. Well, this is like, this was never explained to me. I never yeah. understood yep. that your clients, like the, pe- the insurance that you're representing, like you're being paid by the, like this never, no one ever walked mm-hmm. through to me until I got to my first job. And I was like, oh, 
oh, this is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> like, unless you're going to go work in government or sure. um, for non for profit, there needs to be some sort of business class mm-hmm. in law school, mm-hmm. right? Because again, law firms are a business in terms of how do you get business and keep your clients and I mean, I think I, I went to one mandatory um, session about how to deal with your client, um, uh, you know, your client accounts when I was admitted to the bar that was, you know, put on by New York State about how not to commingle funds. That was it. And it was really like an <laughs> ethics thing. But there really needs to be like some business training, I think, in law school, because you learn all these legal concepts and then you go to a law firm and you're like, oh, wait, we're making money here. And how am I supposed to do that? Right. People, just people about, ask me, how, you know, litigating pieces. Yeah. People have asked me, how would you change law school having been through it? And I always say, make it two years and make it more practical and less theory. Cause you're in the, you're, you're in this yeah. philosophical, you know, like cl- cloud in the sky all the time. It's all so fluffy. And, and you, I think it's funny when I was clerking, I signed up a client in a Starbucks. I met a client in a Starbucks just randomly in the line and they, she had a criminal case against her. And she said, I, I like you a lot. I want to hire you. What do we do? And I didn't, I had no clue. I was a bar admitted attorney in Pennsylvania in a, in a Philadelphia Starbucks. And I said, I don't know, ma'am. I don't know how to do that. And I had to yeah. like go research it. And I, I ended up signing up for $500 for her double felony, which um, wasn't market rated, but that was a lot of money. But- for anyway, so that I digress, but it's, yeah, you're right. You, you don't learn boots on the ground, practical stuff. And I always say that that's the yeah. thing that's missed in law school. It yeah. really is. And I remember somebody once just literally mentioning and passing in law school, my third year, you need to learn how to network and do it well. And I was like, what does that even mean? And it just went, sh- I was like, no, you don't. You just have to practice <laughs> law. And, and it's right. And it was like a really true statement. But like, just to say that to a third year law student, especially ones that are, you know, in their early 20s, it means nothing. I mean, give some practicality around that. Yeah. And I mean, I would even take it further, though. I think, like, and it's something I never did well, is it, you need to network before law school, like one of my really good friends from college always was talking about building her network. And I'm like, what the hell is she talking about? You know? And I'm like, what, what network, what is she building? What is she doing? I don't understand. And I was looking back not so long ago, she was my very first connection on LinkedIn and I'm still very good friends with her today, but she has used her network to get like, to propel her so, so far in her career. And, but she started it early and had a mindset of doing it early. Whereas I was like, Oh, like, I want to go drinking. Like I don't (laughs) building my network. (laughs) Like I have friends. So right. I I think that the the younger generations are more attuned to that. I I feel like I've Mm -hmm. been seeing a lot of um, younger attorneys and like you're saying law students or people breaking Mm -hmm. into the field are being much more proactive that way than we we might've been. Oh, right. Sure. We have a former employee, Megan, who, you know, I'm not going to mention her name, but I hear from her every three months. She's in law school. Now she left our firm to go to law school every three months. She's like, here's a complaint I drafted in an advocacy case. What do you think? Do you have any connections in these fields? Uh, would you want to meet when you're in Philly? I mean, she's, and she's doing that with other people at the firm too. So that's actually, I mean, I, I would yeah, never smart. do that in law school. I'd head down. We're never, do done that. never, yeah. never. And she's, and, and she's, I've connected her with, she wants to do immigration law. I've connected her with friends that do that. She's, she's doing a summer internship through one of our partners at our firm through another, like that someone we know, and she's doing all this just by having work, done good work for us and then email taking a minute every three months, you know, that's yeah. all it takes. So, right. Yeah. She has the hustle. Like, I feel like we yeah. all maybe learn to have the hustle after the fact, but she's ahead of yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, good for her. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> she's young and, and I feel like yeah. they're more in tune with that than we, than I was certainly. I agree. I, yeah. I agree. Nate. If you were to pick an alternative career from where you are now, what do you think you would do? So being where I am right now, I think I would have gone into some sort of sales. I really like, I mean, just enjoy like doing things like this, interacting with people. Um, I, it was horrible during the pandemic when we had to sit at home and didn't get mm-hmm. to see or interact with everyone. And I really enjoy that and developing relationships. I think I would have just totally done something different and gone into sales. Yeah, I do think that the, I mean, the pandemic for me really helped blossom like this, the podcast for, for me, because this wasn't something I was involved in really pre, I think it was on like one episode pre pandemic. And like that, that was something that was definitely missing in my life then too, just the interaction and talking to people. And I found myself like reaching out much, much more, you know, and I think everyone had different ways they approached it too. Like my husband bought 50 pounds of flour and just started like baking everything in sight, (laughs) like, you know, totally different outlook on it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I left Philly. Yeah, Nate moved. <laughs> Where'd you move to? I'm from about two hours north of Philly near Scranton. And the only reason people know Scranton is the office. And Joe office. Biden is from there. But anyway, um, so I'm from near there. And so in the pandemic, my wife and I left the city and came and lived with my parents because we want to get away from the nonsense in the city about masks and getting fines for being in public parks and all the other things. And we found land for sale. And one thing led to another. He said, why don't we move here? And so we're, we moved back to my hometown. We're building a, a house that's going to be ready in about two months. So. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'll tell you a fact about myself. My, I have a dream. It's not even really that far fetched regime but i really would like to be a hobby farmer at some point so that's exactly what i like is to like get out of the city and have just a little bit of land and have some chickens and a goat and mm-hmm. i have a horse so i'd like to have her be a pasture oh. pet in the backyard so good for you that's awesome and i don't know where you live but is that possible near you i mean could you do that near it where is you live um you, you could in like parts of new i live in um hoboken new jersey so you could in like parts okay, of like okay. westchester jersey. <laughs> i don't know if you, yeah, totally. I don't know if you can get yeah, a horse i don't need a lot i need like an acre or two <laughs> No. Well, I, well, you said it. You said at one point. You said at one point the Bay Area, and I don't know if you live in the Bay Area now, but I figure you can't take your horse on the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, there's not really. A lot no, our, yeah, our company <laughs> is based out of the Bay Area. Um, okay. No, I live in an urban area in Hoboken, but yeah, like you know, same probably same as Philly. Like there's surrounding areas. Mm-hmm. I don't need like 25 acres. I'm just saying like an acre or two, right? So I can have some chickens and. Yep. We'll come about yeah, an hour and a half. Hour farming. and a half west. Hour and a half west, you get the, the okay. Poconos, lots of land there. That's where I'm, that's where I'm living. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, our, our managing partner, she actually lives down the street from me and she has a whole chicken coop going on. She's like, mm-hmm. I think she has like seven chickens now. Yeah. I took some time over during the pandemic and educated myself on it. Then I read a bunch of books on like raising chickens and what you needed to do. Um, so I'm all, I'm all set. I'm ready to go. Perfect. Yeah. You're, you're an expert now. Yeah. yeah. We have, we have compost with like 4,000 worms and, I, I'm I'm just so excited that we get to start that process all over again this spring. <laughs> so <laughs> we do we... the city. <laughs> we do the city version of compost, where like the city has bins in parks, so we just collect it and get to dump it in there, and we don't have to do the dirty work of having like the worms and all of. It. Yeah, yeah. Every week it's like, did you feed the worms? And then it's like you have to go and you pick up the thing and you have to put the stuff, and then you have to mix it up. I was like, I didn't sign up for the the worm compost process and somehow i'm i'm feeding these worms just like my fish i didn't sign up for and i'm the only one who feeds them every day (laughs) anyway (laughs) well Corey, it was a delight having you on thank you so much for for joining us and i i promised you it wouldn't be painful and i haven't had anyone come back and tell me it was a bad experience so hopefully you're not my first (laughs) no definitely not thank you both this was great thank you Uh, so for, for our listeners, why don't you tell them where you can find you and, and broker in case, you know, they, they, maybe they have a need and they know where to find you. Sure. So M broker is just www.mbroker.com. Um, if you're looking for insurance, I am just Corey, C-O-R-R-I-E dot Herm, H-U-R-M at mbroker.com. So feel free to reach out. Well, great. And then for, again, for all our listeners, if you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to the Defense of Arrests on Apple Podcasts. And you can also find us on YouTube. I got uh, the, um, the V-neck burgundy memo, which is good. I know. I noticed. I was like, oh, we matched. 